All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS DevStream. We haven't done one of those in a while, and uh, yeah, I finally got time. So some of you guys were interested in uh, seeing my forays into WebAssembly and Rustlang, and uh, while I am still not quite confident in my ability to write Rust language, we're going to do this anyway, because I've played around with it for about two weeks and uh, it's very nice. Like I was surprised at how easy it is to actually build a WebAssembly module with it. So this is what we're going to do today. We're going to take um, WebAssembly, we're going to take Rust, we're going to write a simple module with Rust, compile it to WebAssembly and use it in our front end application. BX Rust repo. Hey, Mech Madrix, welcome to the stream. Uh, no, I don't think like it's a nice language. Actually, was surprised at how easy it is to write it. Uh, you know, especially after my memories of C and C plus plus that I had from like a university, which was not the nicest experience. But yeah, I don't like. I still enjoy writing JavaScript more. Let me just put it this way. Uh, hey, Dragon, welcome to the stream. All right. Um, I mean, it is a very nice language and I, I can see, you know, how I would use it for some cases where I want to be very efficient or where I have a very resource restricted environment on something like this. But majority of time for us, that's not the case. So I just stick with JavaScript, which works perfectly fine. <laughs> but nonetheless, it's really good to actually, uh, it was really good to learn something like this. And I think I will continue to go in through the Rust book. Uh, but yeah, so this is the gist of what I want to do today. I think specifically we're just going to take and compare actually the performance of the WebAssembly module and JavaScript module. So to do that, I decided, you know, let's just do something very stupid and uh, let's just take the markdown, right? So there's plenty of markdown parsers written in JavaScript. There is quite a few written in Rust that are quite popular. So we're going to take the JavaScript uh, markdown parser and render the page in it. And then we're going to do the same with WebAssembly. And then we're going to compare how they're fair on a very large documents, how much time does it actually take to render it? And if you can actually feel any problems with the UI re-renders once we do that. So yeah, uh, one cool thing about Rust that I want to absolutely note is the quality and the consistency of the documentation around not just the Rust itself, but all the tooling that it is there. It is insane. Like uh, you just go to the web, right? And you go like Rust WebAssembly, right? And um, there is literally a book about Rust and WebAssembly over here. That is, I believe this is even official, that is of an amazing quality. Like you just literally go through that and you know everything you need to know about building Rust and WebAssembly modules. Um, hey, Kevin, welcome to the stream. If you had choice, would you use Golang or Rust for the backend? Um, that would highly depend on a lot of other constraints. But if we say, okay, there's an unlimited or like, you know, the resources are not that limited, I would go for Golang because it's just a lot simpler to write, right? It does have the garbage collection uh, thing going for it. So it's not going to be as efficient as Rust, but the language itself is a lot simpler. Like Rust gives you a lot more control. But the language itself is, you know, there's like a ton of things you could do to it. And some of them are absolutely terrifying. And some of them I still don't understand. I, like, I, I mean, okay, admittedly, again, you know, I've been learning Rust for like two weeks. So I'm far from being an expert in it. But um, going back, I mean, again, uh, I'm a bit biased because I already written uh, backend and services in Golang and it worked out perfectly fine for us. And... I mean, Go is a very nice little language. Again, it is garbage collected. The garbage collector is extremely fast in it, but still, you know, we have this GC pauses that are can be a bit un, unnecessary or can be a bit restricting in some environments, but, you know, web services are typically not that critical uh, towards them. Rust was not built for something like this. It's built to be even more efficient. It doesn't have any garbage collection. As you know, the memory management is essentially done on compile time, which is insane on its own. Uh, but yeah, let us go back to our experiment. So as I said, there is a book uh, that is basically rustvasm.github.io. And it's really good. And it basically has everything we need to get started. So I already um, I already skipped basically, or I guess, you know, I already have everything set up because I, as I said, you know, I started dipping into Rust and WebAssembly two weeks ago for the work related stuff. And I already have installed the cargo, Rust, Vasm pack and whatever else, right? So 
What I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and skip all of that. And we're just going to go and generate our um, package straight away. So I'm just going to copy that, paste it in here. So you got the specific uh, WebAssembly pack template that essentially scaffolds the whole project for you. And let's call it VXJS uh, VASM Markdown, right? So let's be very original about the naming. And I'm just gonna CD into it and uh, let me open it in the VS code. That's probably gonna be better than, uh, well, let me think for a second. So we're gonna go to the VXJS uh, VASM Markdown. There we go. I guess I don't really need this terminal here so we can just live in a, inside of our VS code. So we got this thing and uh, I want, you know what? I wanna reopen that in VSL because all my tooling is inside of VSL, which is extremely convenient now. So you can actually separate your gaming side and development side. You can see it picked up the Git immediately, picked up all the plugins, including the Rust plugin and stuff, which is uh, quite nice. So we can CD into it. I don't remember. I don't think we actually need to do anything. So for now, we can just build it. So you have the special uh, command for that. I guess let me just increase the size a bit so that you guys see it a bit better. Uh, so you got the VASM pack command, the tool that you install separately. And all you have to do is really do a VASM pack build, which essentially just build the project for you, right? And not only does it build the project, it also generates all the wrappers that you would normally have to think about yourself, right? Which is, um, again, one of the probably the most impressive things about the Rust ecosystem, the fact that it handles so much for you is just crazy. So this will generate our, um, did I, wait a second. Yeah, I did disable the um, antivirus. So the, oh, what do you call it? The Windows Defender is still annoying as hell and still slows down the VSL to a crawl, but uh, you know. Okay, you can also use Rust Webpack template. But I believe doesn't, I mean, okay, I think like, we'll just follow this book because this is sort of official way of doing it. I have not delved yet into the more advanced templates, but uh, that's a nice comment. So let's just uh, check it out. What's the difference with the, uh, uh, blah, 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 what was it called? The, the <laughs> what was it called? Vassin pack template. Um, Kickstarter your Rust, WebAssembly and Webpack project. There's a template and it has, I guess it has the, okay. Where's the, okay, so you got the sword. Yeah, okay, so it basically has the VAPAC for you. All right, that's convenient because the book for the Rust VASM actually tells you, okay, so now that we built the package module, so you actually get this PKG that contains the uh, VASM file, that contains the TypeScript definitions and contains the JavaScript wrapper that handles everything like the, the WebAssembly imports for you essentially. Um, you still have to basically create the JavaScript project yourself, which is, I mean, it's not that it's you know bad, but it's just additional steps that you have to do yourself. Um, and I guess this uh, Rust Webpack template handles this for you, but you know what, let's just go, let's just go and do it. Um, Manually, basically. Um, npm init, we're gonna run this command and um, we're gonna, yeah, we, let's, let's just do it in the uh, dub dub folder. So this is the npm init ran with a VASM app template, which is exactly what we want. So it basically sets up the app for you. It imports the VASM and by default, it imports from this hello VASM pack. That is not something we want. So I'm just gonna go ahead and rewrite it to PKG, right? So this is, our um, current folder, current package. And if we go inside the uh, www folder, uh, we can just say npm start, I believe. If I know, was it not start? I um, Was it, it is start. Oh, I forgot to do npm install, right? Right, important things. <laughs> okay, so we install the tools and then once I do npm start, we should be able to basically see our tiny alert script working. Um, nope, that's not what I want. npm start. And it starts, so basically the template itself is just the web pack correctly configured. But once you go to localhost 8080, I believe, and we're going to see our hello bxjs vast markdown, right? And this is, so this is uh, not the alert from the um, JavaScript side, but this is actually an alert from our librs. And there you can see, so we use the VASM bind gen to bind the external alert function, which is the, in this case, the browser alert function. 
to the Rust and then invoke it from our public function greet to say hello, our package. And then we just call this greet method, right? So pretty straightforward. Now, um, now basically we got it scaffolded. So I guess I'll just, uh, I'll just commit all of that. Uh, let me go up. Status, get ads, let's see, whoops. Um, the dub modified gets it is scaffolded with a git in, inside of the this folder and um, let me see yes we do have git so i'm gonna kill it from here because we don't need it right and new file dub 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 why is it new file um it shouldn't be a file right okay why is it a file i am a bit confused right now but okay git i will just sell okay Initial project scaffold, right? Sign the commits and there we go. Okay, so we got our basic project version. We scaffolded it and everything is nice. Um, did it just, wait a second. Here's my question, git ignore. No, it didn't ignore the uh, dot, dot, dot folder. Neither did it ignore this. I guess we can just, uh, yeah, whatever. You know what, that should work fine. Okay, so what we need to do now is we actually need to, um, I mean, I guess we can start with writing a simple user interface in JavaScript that will actually allow us to compare our, or to use first the JavaScript markdown um, component, some sort of, and then we're gonna use the same, we're gonna use the, uh, WebAssembly component for markdown rendering and we're gonna compare the speed, right? I'm gonna say div ID, so I'm gonna create two divs. This is gonna be JS markdown and this is gonna be a awesome markdown. I'm gonna create two divs and what the hell is this for? Um, right, sometimes my, is that because of the word wrapping? No, it is not. So sometimes my, um, what do you call it? Oh boy, how do you name it? God damn it, prettier goes a bit crazy and formats things in a very weird way. I'm not sure if that's the VSL fault or, or my misconfiguration somewhere on my Windows machine, but that from time to time just has to happen. Okay, so we got the bootstrap. The bootstrap I believe is just basically yeah, imports the module here dynamically. And uh, what we need is we need to find, um, let's go to yarn package and we're gonna find common mark something. Yeah, we can just use common mark, I guess, right? Let's go for the, wait a second. Um, so NPM fastest markdown renderer. I remember there was some library that was like, we are super fast and we support common mark. So let's compare the fastest available markdown library in JavaScript to the one that we can compile from Rust, right? Um, da -da -da, there was one with the benchmarks. There we go, there's the benchmarks. So we got the marks. So this one, common mark reference, thousand ops, current 700 ops. I mean, so this is relatively fast. Showdown, do they have benchmarks here? Da, da, da. There's like a lot of examples, vulnerability tests. Um, no, they don't have benchmarks. So we're gonna um, fastest markdown remark. I think remarkable was also touting to be like really fast. So let's do that. Um, come on, just the benchmarks somewhere here. Yeah, there we go. There's the benchmark common mark reference 40 ops. So this actually claims to be faster than the reference from common mark, which is uh, quite nice. So I guess let's try that maybe. Is there remarkable doesn't play. Okay. So and this supports all the, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's go with the remarkable, right? So this sounds like a nice option. They claim to be a lot faster than the um, common mark parser. So let's do that. So got the remarkable. We basically need to import that. You need the stuff and this is what we want, right? So this is our markdown parser. So JS markdown stuff. This is gonna be our JavaScript markdown stuff. And now it's gonna be VASM markdown stuff. 
uh, it's very very nice commenting um so theoretically once we do npm start i need to open the console over here once we do an npm start should be able to see the markdown rendered in the console right come on compile successfully f5 so we're going to see the no we we are not seeing the alert what is happening right now why is it not working compiling da -da -da. file successfully yes so where is my um localhost 8080 yeah okay and somehow it doesn't work why it doesn't work uh there's no scripts anymore interesting okay i think i just broke it somehow and i'm a bit confused because we haven't okay so here's a question if i just command those out we could just use the javascript they mark down uh nope that's completely broken <laughs> wait a sec is that my browser acting up or something is it because i have a del no that's I haven't really changed that much, right? What is happening right now? Uh, yes, 8080, control click to follow link. Okay, I don't have any blockers or anything like that, so that should not be the case. We got no script. Where is my script tag? Oh, oh, okay. Bec okay, now I see. <laughs> God damn it. Right, so that was my... Uh, okay, it was my fat finger. I did no script n and it just wrapped everything into no script So it's my own fault, right? And there we go. So it actually renders exactly what you would expect Which means that we need um, So that's our text area, right and um, let's Give it an ID input text and let's give it um, like a little markdown this is a test. So theoretically, we should now see the um, input area, right? Is there? Yeah, right. Because this should not have so many spaces or tabs, I guess. So this now, there we go. Okay. And now, so we can say, okay, const text area is going to be documents, get element by ID. Um, what did I name it? Input text. So that and text area add event listener change, I believe. So then we just do what do we need to do? We need to get text, right? Const text is gonna be text area. Um how do you get the value from man? I haven't written um I haven't written the <laughs> non-react code in ages. Okay. Let me think about it. Uh, text area, get text, right. Was it inner text or something? No, I don't need jQuery, please. I get elements. Is it just value? Am I overthinking it? Not node value, what are you doing? Console log text, right? So let's try this. Um, no, that doesn't work. Okay. Um, I guess it is not that. No, wait, it should log something. Oh boy. Hell if I remember text area on change. Does it have a change? Okay. You know what? I probably need to just go to MDN and look at the text area description. Change events. Table select. Um, where's my, okay. No, 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 no. God damn it. That was the wrong button text area right so this is what we want we want to go to the text area and we want our javascript api uh, so this is all styling this is all no 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 technical there is it is an element so theoretically should have text area uh the on change event right why it's been so long that i've used anything like that i Honestly, don't remember things. Text area on change, right? So let's just let's just do the old way. Okay, I don't want jQuery. I want vanilla JS, please. On change key up paste. Uh, I mean, I guess we could listen to key up. That will probably be the best way, right? Key up. 
Right, and we can just go console log e because I think, yeah, I think if we tap into the event, right? There we go. So we got the event. And if we go into the target, this has a value. Perfect style. It does have a value. Okay, so you can extract it like this. So e, right, so we can get um, text like this and we just go e target value. For some reason, the manual selection of that doesn't really help. And we also probably need to tweak that text area to have columns 10 and rows 10 as well, I guess. No, that's too little. Um, 50 or something? Yeah, that's too much. 30? That looks good. Okay. Okay, so we got the markdown going now. And now we can actually process that text. So let's just do it on every key press because we are uh like we can't like we want to measure the performance right so this is some handle user input and we're gonna say so let's create um const render remarkable let's call it like this it's going to be a function that takes in texts and da -da -da -da. so this is what we want to run come on go Okay, um, we, we render text, gonna be HTML, right? And then we're gonna, okay, first of all, we need to get the elements on uh, remarkable div, let's call it this way, document, what, no, doc, God, I'm typing Docker so much, it's already in my fingers. Um, so we get the element by ID and that was JS markdown. And then what we do is we just say remarkable diff inner HTML equals HTML, right? So theoretically, render remarkable text. Do that. Okay. And there's our HTML, right? So theoretically, if I just go like this, perfect, it works. Um, we do want to measure timing. So I guess we can just say well, console time remarkable let me just uh type this correctly time ends right so theoretically now if we do that we get a nice timing and obviously the larger our document is going to be the more time is going to take for remarkable to actually render it but um, it's actually surprisingly fast it's like four milliseconds for well very large i mean okay there's not that many styles in there but you know it's a relatively large document Okay, now that we got this down, we need to, um, so okay, render with remarkable. Now that we got this down, we need to render with uh, WebAssembly, right? So I'm gonna save this, and then we're gonna switch to our WebAssembly style, uh, side of things. I'm gonna stop this. I'm gonna go into Rust, and uh, in this case, I guess we don't really care about the external bindings because we're not gonna be doing anything, right? We're actually gonna be just returning things. So we're gonna say render. I'm gonna kill that for now. I'm gonna save this. So here's the thing: we need um, now we need a package for. Uh, I should not have closed this. We need a package for Rust, right? So typically, what you do is you go to crates.io which is npm like registry for rust so they have this cargo um, uh, cargo package manager and you got the crates for it and we just go markdown and i guess let's sort by all time downloads and we got this pull down cmark package so we're gonna just copy that and put it in our cargo toml um i think there's our dev dependencies, there's our dependencies. So we just put it over here, right? And where is an example of using the package? So do, 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 Bible parser, common mark spec. Maybe, maybe, maybe we can just look at the GitHub. Uh, text processing, come on. Documentation, there we go, that's what I want, right? Okay, cool. Uh, so we, first of all, we use our uh, namespace for it. So this will import the package essentially, right? We got our markdown input. This is will be provided uh, for us by uh, 
WebAssembly? Well, sorry, by JavaScript, right? Uh, hey, Donna, welcome to the stream. Yes, we haven't done one of those in a while. <laughs> okay, and um, this is exactly the code we want to use. Okay, we don't need this assertion at the end, but... Okay, so we don't need this expected HTML. And we do need this stuff, right? And this is going to be markdown inputs and it's going to be I think it's going to be a string reference if I am not mistaken. Does it take string reference? Yes, it takes a string reference. Okay, pointer I think it's called correctly, right? Uh, am I declaring this incorrectly because hell if I remember again, I just again caveats, you know, I've been writing Rust for less than two weeks and I don't remember a lot of things. So I'm probably going to look at the docs a lot and I'm probably a Rust pointer function declaration is what I want. I know that I want pointer and I want to, I know, I know that I want it in function declaration, but um, I need, I think it's, is it the, the, this is what I'm missing? No. God damn it. Oh, it's the other way around. Is it? This is what I want. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So first the variable name and then the type declaration. In this case, it has the string pointer. We create options. We enable strike through. I don't, do we ever need that? I think we just go with the default options, right? So we create the parser, we create new string, and then we return HTML output. Um, I believe, no, it does take options. God damn it. Okay. So that was, you know what, let's just, yeah, just have an empty object here. And I believe we also need to uh, declare the output of a function. And how do we do that? We do this like, is that, 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 yeah, that is Rust, right? So the output is also a string reference. There we go. Okay. So if I didn't screw anything up, theoretically, this should actually build. Uh, I am in the wrong folder. So if I didn't screw anything up, this should compile into a proper WebAssembly module. And I did, of course, I did screw something up. So we're going to try and figure out this thing. Use HTML uh, unused imports. Right. So we are not using what? I think we're using everything, or? We'll see, Mark, we are using HTML. Are we using? No, we're not using HTML, actually. This is what probably it's complaining about, right? It's, uh, what? No, God damn it. As pack built. Um, now what? Unused imports, but I'm using them. What are you talking about? Can I return board ref? Ah, uh, is it should be just a string? Are you overthinking that? Size of value store cannot be known at compilation time. Okay. Um, can I just, re here's the question, HTML push HTML. Can I just return that module somehow? Now we're going to suffer a bit. Um, regular string is string. Okay. Can I, well, well here's the like, first question was what does this actually push HTML return? Because they just send the mutable HTML output to it and then Oh, I guess, I guess we just need to do this, right? Uh, that's, that should theoretically cannot return a borrowed ref this Watson bind gen. Okay, I'm guessing it wants me to return a proper string. And how do I do that? Bum, 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 bum. Maybe. Maybe. Okay. So, okay, so this is now says undeclared module, but I, oh, right. So we did use HTML, why do you? Okay, there we go. No more complaints. Uh, okay, this doesn't need to be mutable indeed because we're not mutating options. We just got the options empty. I think it should compile now, right? So there was like minor, some minor bugs. Um, function set panic hook. That code, what is that panic code? Where are we getting this? Adding was combined gen, done. Oh, okay, so it's actually built as just a warning. Okay, cool. Um, right, so it's built. 
And I guess it should work. <laughs> We're gonna find out in a second. So in theory, our package now, if we look at the definitions, have a render method, right? That uh, takes in a string. So which means we can move this over here and create the exactly same thing, but for WebAssembly, right? And it removed my imports as VASM from EKG, right? I believe it was this way. And what we need to do is, uh, we need to say, okay, this is VASM diff. I believe it was VASM markdown, right? And we go render VASM, the text, and then we say VASM render, right? There we go. So we even get the type definitions and nice uh, tooltip and now we just render that with WebAssembly. Yeah, awesome. And I need to remember to replace this. All right, um, we go into this folder, do npm start. And again, if I didn't screw anything up, this should theoretically work just fine, right? Let's fire out the console. Reload this thing, there we go. Okay. And uh, yeah, I guess let's just edit the uh, thing at first. So this is remarkable. And this is gonna be VASM. So that we can actually distinguish between them, right? Okay, there we go. Uh, and yes, we, it would be good to find some very big, uh, let me think for a second. So we can just take um, and take the exaframe change log because this thing is huge at this point. And this and raw, it is, oh, wait, wait, what? This just failed because it's too big. No, it can't be a thing, right? It just Chrome acting up, where's my Firefox? Okay, do you? There we go. Okay, let me just, for some reason, Chrome's been acting really, really weirdly later, like lately for me. Okay. And still not that much difference. I mean, okay, three times slower the Remarkable is. So 10 milliseconds for Remarkable, three milliseconds for WebAssembly. Um, but you know what? Let's try adding more. Like the larger gets, yeah, so it's like three, four times faster, right? Um, this DOM, by the way, is insanely large right now. <laughs> this seems to be working quite nicely. Um, that is a lot faster than I expected. Uh, we need more, yeah. I mean, I can just copy paste it like a few more times. Uh, there we go, okay. <laughs> I think it's already DOM lagging, not the render actually. But you can actually see, so the remarkable already take, I mean, it's still quite fast. It's like 300 milliseconds. This document is insanely large right now and it only takes 300. So here's the thing, let's try, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, so if we, re, uh, if we disable rendering, right? As in, we don't add it to the div, we just render it to the string and throw it out essentially, right? And I paste it down and we have, well, relatively large documents. I paste it like four or five times and then we increase this even more. Okay, so at this point, okay, the browser is already lagging and now you can see the difference. So the remarkable starts taking above, again, this is still really fast. You are not likely to have a markdown document that is this, oh God, it just, uh, the text area is, <laughs> I cannot even resize it properly. Okay, yeah, so browser is having problem with this much text, but even the JavaScript remarkable markdown renderer takes just 247 milliseconds to render this thing. Okay, 353 in the worst case, right? The WebAssembly is a lot faster, so it's like three times faster in general, right? And I imagine it's also gonna be way more memory efficient. So here's the question. I wonder, like, let me just, um, let me go here, copy all of that, right? I wonder if, if we kill that, right? So we kill Remarkable and only leave the WebAssembly. 
Uh, okay, no, that's definitely just a DOM lagging at this point because even as I pasted the browser frozen or was frozen, but it feels like it is because of this text area is essentially struggling to do anything to that much text. But uh, yeah, I mean, there you go. That's basically all it takes to build a WebAssembly module. And once you've built it, you can essentially take this PKG and ship it to uh, NPM and then NPM install it and reuse it, which works pretty nicely. Um, the downside is obviously because WebAssembly right now only understands numbers. We already talked about this at the last podcast, I believe, or two podcasts ago. You have this um, wrapper code essentially that polyfills and, you know, makes the memory interchangeable, converts the things to strings and from numbers to strings, from strings to numbers and so on and so forth. But the cool thing is that actually the uh, Rust handles all of that for you, so you don't have to worry about it. Yes, WebAssembly IDL bindings are gonna change everything. This is gonna be amazing. Like the fact that you would be able to literally ship one VASM file and all of the WebAssembly platforms will understand it is gonna be great. Like it's just, you can basically throw away like all of this and just ship one VASM file, which is kind of great. Okay, but uh, yeah, let me just commit that and I guess push to the repository. Uh, get status, get, okay, uh, we are here. Why did it, wait a second. So it feels like it, I had changes to my files in here as well. Why is it not? Did it include my git sub repo as a git module or something? Uh, God, okay. Um, another git repository seems to be running. Oh, okay. Um, so how do I undo this? Uh, this is annoying. So let's, I mean, we just scaffold, you know what? Maybe I just dropped the whole git repo because, oh man, I added it as a sub module, I think, is it? In a second, cat dot git. Um, add the so the config is straightforward. Info objects refs. We have any? There's the head stacks. Oh, is it possible to debug Rust codes? Uh, of course, it is possible, but you would basically have to build it in a way, or like debug it in a way that you know you build it as a Rust library, then debug it in place, and then ask add Vasm bind gen uh, bindings later on. At least this is my understanding. Again, you know I've been using Rust for like past two weeks, so don't take my word for it. I'm far from being an expert here. Um, Donna, thank you very much for your donation. As usual, highly appreciate your support. Um, okay, let me try to figure out this Git issue. Why? So it included dub 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 folder as sub module, but not really. Um, but no, it's is it 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 it, it I didn't need sub modules, right? Yes. Yeah, there is no sub modules. Okay. Or path that why you no sub module found in git modules. Um so okay, wait a second. Git sub module remove. Oh, there's a day need, I think. All there we go. No. Okay, how, how, why the hell is it? I am so, wait a sec, I'm so confused. Right? So we, it added the dub, dub, dub folder, but it added it as a folder, like as in a file, one file. Why does it happen? Uh, I also probably should move the license MIT to license and remove the license Apache. Okay, you know what? I'm just gonna kill the Git and re it because I am very confused as to why that happened. Right, if we add this, we should actually add the dub 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 folder as actual folder. There we go, perfect. Um, we don't need these licenses over here, right? Whoop. So we can uh, clean up the repo bits, uh, all of them, please. What else? 
Yes, yes, you can do that. Okay, so this is fine. This is fine. This is fine. The wrapper looks okay. We don't need this Travis file. Uh, whip, nope. Right, so this looks okay. Um, thank you very much for your subscription as well. Highly appreciate it. Okay, uh, so we got the BIM. Yeah, this looks okay, right? I don't think we actually need this utils thing. Oh, this is where the unused code was coming from. Okay, cool. So we can kill that. I think we can kill that. Wait a second. So if I remove source utils and then we do vasm pack build uh, mod utils. So we are, yeah, okay. We are importing it in our libres. If I do that, this should compile now. Perfect. Okay, cool. So we cleaned the unused code. I mean, our library ended up being very, very simple. Uh, but uh, I think we're good. This looks fine. This looks okay. We, yeah, we use the pull C mark. Okay, cool. So I guess I can just commit that. There we go. Get commit minus M. Basic uh, Rust Vasm module for markdown rendering rendering there we go did i not miss yes i did mistype it that's good <laughs> okay cool so meanwhile i'm gonna create a repo on github and uh push it there um that's been a while since i've done that what is going on with my github what is happening now okay uh clear the cache that was the Chrome wipe DNS. There was the Chrome DNS flush thing that. Okay, my Chrome is just. What is happening? Chrome internals DNS. Near host cache. There we go. Are you started working? What is going on? Uh, yeah, something is a bit broken for me right now. <laughs> but the cool thing is it actually works in Firefox. So let me just. What? But no, not here. Come on, doc. Okay, GitHub. Um, I just table all notifications for two hours, please. Thank you very much. And I'm not logged in. Uh, right. So let me just do that. Okay, it's probably gonna ask for my authentication code. <laughs> God damn it. Uh, it just has to be this, right? It's like never goes the way that it's supposed to go. Hey, let me think. Uh, no, no, ignore this. Uh, no, dude, come on. No, there's my GitHub. Oh, this is GitLab. This is GitHub. Okay, three nine six five five eight. Right, there we go. Finally working. So, um. Learning hard because of English. Just keep listening. Like, my, my way of learning English was to play games and watch TV shows that had, you know, the um, more slower paced stuff, I guess, and then switching to basically everything else. That worked out quite well. So we're gonna do that. What? Copy this. There we go. Okay. Simple Rust. Vas module uh, mo module that renders markdown. That's what we got. We don't need to initialize anything. I'm still confused why Chrome doesn't load the pages while the Firefox actually does. What is going on here? It just guess I have to restart it. Maybe <laughs> not entirely sure what's happening, but hey, okay. So we got that, we created the repo, we need to add the remote origin and we need to push the code there. So as you can see, we built a Rust WebAssembly module without really knowing too much Rust in about 50 minutes. I mean, I guess about 15 of them I've spent combating my computer because of all the issues we had here and there, but it actually works. I probably should also update the readme. Yes, and it is 3x performance over the uh, JavaScript module, which is damn impressive. Let me just update the readme. You know what? I don't like that. It's a default one. That's that's not a good view, right? Um. So let's see. Uh, we can is literally HTML here. Okay. 
kill that. We can go to something like Snapper RSS Reader and edit this, copy all of that, paste it here, and be like simple Rust as module that renders it renders uh, markdown on rendering markdown via rust as module okay uh so i will oh man i should probably update that it's like i start going through the old code and there is just a lot of stuff that i should do but never had time to god damn it okay introduction uh, introduction to Rust and Masm. Let's call it this way. Small demo showing how to use Rust Lang to build a simple Masm markdown rendering module. There we go. Uh, meanwhile, guys, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them into the chat. I will be more than happy to talk and um, answer any questions that you might have. I probably should also update this at one point, but not right now. So I need to rustlang is one thing that I need to reference. This is gonna be rust. Rust fasm book is what we want so rust fasm there's this super nice book latest version please thank you very much and i think that is basically it more rust i mean if you have any suggestions because i've been trying to come up with uh, interesting use cases and uh i mean i did this because some of you guys were interested in seeing it and it, overall and i think this is a nice tutorial but JSX, why would you want to do JSX in the browser and WebAssembly? That sounds like a terrible idea. <laughs> I mean, we could do that, I guess. But is there a JSX? Comp I mean, there is a JSX compiler for Rust, right? Crates.io. Uh, no, not IOP. Um, JSX, I think. Yeah, so there is a JSX syntax. Wait a second. All time downloads. Okay, utility allows you to count codes, view, squark. Hmm. There's a framework called U. Oh, okay. So this is the one, right? U Rust framework inspired by Elm and React. But it seems to be like a Rust framework rather than the JSX renderer, right? So if we were to do JSX rendering in WebAssembly via Rust, that would mean we would have to write our own JSX parser, which is, oh boy, I don't know if I want to do that. <laughs> like, I guess it could be very fun, but uh, that sounds terrifying, to be honest. Okay, are you working now? GitHub? No, that's just DNS probe die. I, I, okay. Well, my Chrome is borked now. Okay. Sam updates readme and push. There we go. There are procedural macros. Yeah, I know that there are macros in Rust, and this is effectively how the JSX works there because you can do anything. Uh, you can literally do anything with a syntax, which is super awesome, by the way. Terrifying at the same time that you can, you know, screw everything up terribly, but really, really cool. But uh, yeah, we like if you want to render the JSX via the WebAssembly in the browser, we, it would mean we need some sort of a parser, right? That would ingest the JSX, parse it into something, and then produce the HTML. So I guess abstract syntax tree or something. Um, I mean, I guess we could do that. I'm not very good with parsers. Like I've, I've used um, I've used a few grammar parsers in my time by writing custom grammars. But uh, yeah, Rust game. Yes, that's the thing. And uh, it's it's a terrible game. But... Like half of my internet is not working. There's like images stopped loading. What is wrong with my Chrome? I think it may be time to switch to Firefox. <laughs> God damn it. Oh boy, okay. I need to go investigate why it stopped working all of a sudden. But okay, um, yeah, I think we're, we're actually done here pretty much. Firefox Dev Edition. I actually have to try that. Wait a second. Firefox Dev Edition. I remember that being a thing, but I installed it like when they just released it and it wasn't, you know, that much different from the actual Firefox. So I was like, yeah, whatever. I have to try it now, especially since I've been doing quite a lot of CSS lately. So that might be, that might be very handy. 
Okay. Thank you for reminding me that this exists. <laughs> okay. Uh, God damn it. Come on. Go back in there. Okay. Uh, do you guys have any more questions, suggestions, or anything you want to discuss? If not, we can just wrap it up here. I think that was a decent video. Again, me struggling with uh, Rust is, you know, I don't know why would you want to see this, but apparently you did. And uh, me... Tr oh, it... Now it worked. No, it... Wait, what? <laughs> it just loaded. What is going on? What is going on with my Chrome? It just... You've seen that, right? It was just loaded. And now it's... God damn it. Okay. You know what? For the sake of my sanity, let's just... Let's just consider that uh, this stream is over. I'm gonna go do a reboot of my computer and um, try to figure out what the hell was it. I have, an, I have an idea that it might be actually because of the VSL, because when you use it, it tends to interfere quite a bit with the networking stack. So because I was using VSL and because I was doing the whole, you know, Chrome, using it with Chrome and Webpack, I have an idea that it might have been because of that. So it might have actually screwed over with, uh, uh, with the networking stack. No VSL 2 is not out. It's only available in the preview builds, uh, but I'm really waiting for it, at least when it's going to be in beta version available to the stable build, because I don't want to go into Insider because of games, but the VSL 2 looks really promising. They even recently announced that they managed to run Docker inside it, which is really cool. Uh, Kevin, thank you so much for your donation. Highly appreciated, man. That is really awesome. Thank you. Um, but yeah, enough ranting over here. So again, thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. As usual, you can find the VOD on YouTube if you missed any of the parts and want to see me suffer more. Um, if you have any questions uh, or want to, um, I don't know, want to teach me more Rust, I actually appreciate any tips that you might have. Because I mean, it's really interesting to learn it, actually. It's, like, it's been a while since I've coded in anything that low level. Uh, join our Discord server. And uh, yes, I would be more than happy to chat about that. Um, ooh, BXJS GitHub actually got access to GitHub Actions. You guys want to see the video on GitHub Actions? Because I am kind of excited about those. Because having everything integrated into the GitHub is mad. I'm like, I looked at the documentation they have and those things look really awesome. So we might as well do GitHub actions for JavaScript development at some point. They even have like Node.js and Node package things here. CI test published. Interesting. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, by the way, even though I do not see your smiles and images over here, I have the stream. Um, Streamlabs OBS running on the other screen and actually see the images and everything. It works fine. <laughs> so it's definitely my Chrome is just acting terrible. <laughs> but okay, um, I guess that's basically it. Once again, thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the stream. And uh, yeah, thanks for your continued support. Have an awesome rest of the week and I see you next time. Bye.